Hello, um, I'm Ingrid Went, and thank you for inviting me, Michelle. And it's a pleasure to be part of this anthology, and a great pleasure to be reading with other poets whom I admire um, here at Portland State University. And thank you all for coming. Um, I have one small correction to make to my bio note. It, not that you would have known it, Michelle, because two days ago I decided to change the title of my next book. <laughs> and instead of Fragile Soil, it will now be called Even Song. So it will be coming out next August. Uh, Michelle asked us to read the poems in the book, and then I'm going to read one by somebody else who isn't here. Um, the two poems that are in this anthology are also going to be in the new book. And so I'll start with the first one. Um, after a class in seaweed. And for those who like listening for forms, um, this is in a form, I can't remember exactly which one, because I wrote it some time ago, but it is in sestets, meaning each stanza has six lines, and there's a rhyme scheme, which I hope you won't really, I hope it won't, won't really stick out. So we'll see. After a class in seaweed, which was written, um, about the Oregon coast and about um, taking a class at the Hatfield Marine Science Center. We had to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and meet them there at 6 and went out at low tide to gather seaweed and learned a lot about it. It was kind of fun and um, almost delicious, almost. <laughs> These names like exotic diseases, Alaria, Porphyra, Fucus, or terms transmitted from dark rooms, tri iridia, tri laminaria. These are gorgeous names. Still, it's hard to imagine our world's future food supply blessed with names like bullwhip kelp, though that's what it looks like. And history shows maiden's hair is poisonous, leaving us if we stick with the representational, sea palm and lettuce, high in iron, potassium, iodine, protein, you name it. And once you see how good they can taste, who knows, you might impress your friends with your daring. You might start a new trend. Believe me, these new scientist cooks know what they're up to. Last week I stir-fried some kind of algae with onions, green peppers, garlic, and soy sauce. Forgot it wasn't spinach. Tried porphyry chips with salsa, disguising an aftertaste clinging like limpets, like shriveled up slug trails that don't wash off. Anything's possible, like tonight. The casserole I took to the potluck, full of sea palms everyone took to be diced black olives, smothered with hamburger, tucked into a sauce of tomato and cheddar, like finding good intentions, not only tricking the tongue, but blinding. Sea palms are really cool. Um, you probably have seen them out in the farthest rocks, because they need active surf to survive. And, we find them sometimes washed up on the beach, and then you chop them up, you dice them up, and you start stir-frying them, and they turn from a drab army green into this vivid emerald, you know, like an emerald city, just gorgeous. But they're not cooked yet, and you have to keep cooking and cooking and cooking until they turn black, and they're not nearly so interesting then. The next poem is very different. It's going to be the next to last poem in my book. And Michelle mentioned something about reading poems that aren't necessarily in the book. So I'm going to follow this one, which is kind of heavy, with um, a different book, <coughs> and, and then end with something by someone else. This is titled Benediction, and um, it has an epigraph, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, which is part of the liturgy of the Protestant church, if you could say it has a liturgy, that I grew up in. Um, it's looking for water. Benediction. Because I'd once been told what women always had done, though never how or why. After you died, the last tube taken out and gone, and they offered to leave us alone, I asked 
if I could wash you. The soapy water was warm as you were still and soft. The basin was round, the towels and washcloths thick and white. And there was no strangeness in it, really, and I didn't cry, and that, too, was part of the wonder. I began with one smooth, pliant arm, as once you daily must have done with me, as once you must have done at your own mother's death. I carefully dipped one cloth and care carefully wrung it, and carefully bathed the whole freckled length of your arm, your docile hand, each finger light in its yielding. And though you had no choice in acquiescing to my love, I did not revel in my power, but slowly lifted, washed, and patted dry each limb in turn, your crooked toes, and in between the toes, your shoulders, breasts, the secret folds between your legs, thin pubic hairs, and with a different cloth which would have been your way, your face. I took my time. I lingered in this unexpected absence of condition or demand. And when at last, with nothing more to do, I sat beside your bed and took the hand I'd long since lost the need to hold, and laid my grown-up hand inside. Oh, familiar shape my fingers knew by heart, and had forgotten that they'd ever known. How long this total rightness had been gone. And as leisurely as once I must have done when simple being was enough to please you, I let my eyes, without distraction, wander every tiny detail of your face, its astonishing calm. I saw again your chin unguarded, saw your knuckles worn, arthritic, sang a tune that came from who knows where. This is the hand that fed me, hand that held me, hand that punished me hand that led me. For hours, sunlight was the only thing that moved, and soon would be gone, and your hand and mine still warm. I stood to kiss your forehead. It was cold, but I had been in the presence of holiness, world without end, and was done. And then a shorter poem, which is going to be the last in my new book, titled Sanctuary. And it's about singing. I wrote this poem to accompany or to be put into a program of poems called Dona Nobis Pachem. Um, this program was, or this, this anthology was handed out with programs in Eugene at the Holt Performing Arts Center when the Eugene Concert Choir, of which I used to be a member, sang a whole program called Dona Nobis Pachem. All the poems are about peace. Give us peace is what that means. So I wrote this for that program and read it at the Holt Center. Sanctuary. As flocks of birds from the depths of the field rise in unison, arc and wheel and dip with no one bird in the lead and settle again into land. As fish in their silent schools flash silver together, pivot and pivot again on the same invisible axis. When the music begins and we in our separate section stop that inner ever-present mental chatter and join together in song, again I forget that in the last election, the second soprano next to me almost certainly voted wrong. <laughs> that in tomorrow's headlines, the next suicide bomber will take away more lives than any one heart can mourn. 
that in the next town a friend lies dying, that global warming tomorrow will give us yet one more extinction. Here, floodwaters rising will threaten no one. Tenderness rises and is not scorned or shunned. Anger on the horizon crashes and rolls, breaks without mercy over our heads, and no harm is done. What is sacred space if not this shelter of song? What is prayer if not these measures in which our hearts can pour itself out, 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 and the notes will catch it, help bear it along? Moments in which each wounded and fragmented self abides again in the wonder of wholeness here in this place, this home. And a poem by Joy McDowell of Springfield, Oregon. Joy uh, won what's called the Editor's Choice Award for Oregon. She uh, was chosen by the editors out of all of us Oregon poets as the one to receive the highest honor and $200. Um, and I love these poems, so I'm going to read one of hers. It's very short. It's called The Rest I Imagine. There are things men and women don't talk about. Things like brutal acts of war, miscarriages, and in the woods, the graphic way a man can die. After the accident with the helicopter, my husband is stoic. He was, he is, excuse me, he was the first man on the scene, the first with a stretcher, the first to see what a helicopter's tail rotor can do to the head of a forester from Wisconsin a forester just out of college, a young man who for a split second forgot about the flying blades, saw only his bags of fertilizer. The tail rotor suffered damage. The helicopter could not fly. Another helicopter did the evacuation. My husband claims it's the best thing when the kid dies in ICU six hours later. The rest I imagine while I mix corn muffins and ladle out chili. Our son tells us about the tree fort he and his friend are building. The cat jumps on my husband's lap, circles and starts purring. It doesn't take long to make brownies. This time, I frost them.